our first project, first iOS project for Unit 2 is a tic-tac-toe game. Let's make this a bit bigger so we could see in the back. It's a tic-tac-toe game. The usual norm, we fork the repo, we clone, we complete the project, we push our changes to our fork, and we submit a pull request with our fork link. Everybody with me? Right? So that we've, we've done from unit one, assignment one. The game is tic-tac-toe, player versus player. So you have an X, you have an O. Anybody not familiar with tic-tac-toe, by the way? I don't want to make any assumptions here. Uh, great. So requirements. Alternating turns, right? One player goes first, they have X. Next player goes, they have O, X, O, X, O, until some player wins. Everybody with me? You win if it's on the same row, like you have three Xs on the same row. It could be the same column. When I say row, I'm talking about left, right here. We have a row. And columns, we have top down. So far, so good. You could also win if it's a diagonal. We've all played tic-tac-toe before. So let's see what the game looks like, right? So here in the second view here, where it says hooray, the player won because it's a column, right? There were X's in all of that second column there, so that player wins the game. So far, so good. I could also win if I have a diagonal, right? From left to right, or from right to left, right? So I could win those three, those three ways, through a row, through a column, through a, di uh, a diagonal. Everybody with me? Okay, this is an MVC project, right? The earlier projects were not exactly MV, M MVC in that sense, right? Because there's not so much logic happening there. So you could get away with having everything in the view controller. But that particular project, you really want to think of the heart of the game. What's the heart of the game here? Anybody? Like, what drives the game? What's the data behind the game? When we talk about tic-tac-toe, what's the data? Player one, player two, those are two players, right? But what are they playing? The positions, right? So the board, right? The board of the game is the heart of the game. How do you know somebody wins? The board lets you know if they win. So far, so good. Player one, player two doesn't have enough information there to see if somebody won. What, how you know is that visual board or that board that you're playing with. Everybody with me? So at some point, you have a model, which is a, a board. Right? You could call that board or whatever you want. But it's its class, right, somewhere. And that's what I click on a button, that gets updated. Right? I click on a button, that gets updated. My board now has some value. Every time I play, very similar to Blackjack, right? Every time I play, there's something figuring out if somebody won or not. Right? With our Blackjack game, it was like game status. Everybody, I, every time I get a hit from my card, my deck, I find out if I have a score. Right? Am I blackjack? Am I over blackjack? With my board, do I have a player? Every time somebody plays, you want to see if there's a player. Everybody with me? So really and truly, the heart of that project is figuring out who won. Right? Who won at what time you need to stop the game there? Or was there a tie? Right? Was there a tie or did somebody win? That's, that's the two scenarios you have. So far, so good. Or you could just have reset the game, right? There's a reset button as well, where it says new game there. All right, let's go back to the requirements. So number one, alternating turns, right? Between player one and player two, right? Your layout must have a label, according to what we have here. There's a label to say whose, whose turn it is. Is it player one or player two? We have a button to reset the game, right? Where it says new game here, that's a button. Right, it resets the game, that's number three. The win condition, win condition check-in, a game is over when a player has marked three in a row. Right, not only three in a row, everybody with me? Right, it's not a true tic-tac-toe game if it's only rows you're checking for. Right, so disregard why it says three in a row here. You check in three in a row, you check in three in a column, and what, what else? Three diagonal, very good. So those are the scenarios there. The part it says don't worry about is the design aspect of it. If you have time, you can make your thing like really stand out as far as like UI is concerned. But the main goal is to start figuring out how does somebody win, right? You could even do that separately. 
we'll talk about the UI a little bit, like try to get us up to date with like how to figure out what button got pressed there. Great. So that's the basic UI of the game. Any questions so far? Yes. Okay, we're here all day. Uh, cool. So let's get started. I want to talk about uh, this part here where it says um, the uh, IB inspectable. I want to talk about IB inspectable a little bit. So the best way we'll talk about it. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just for you. Uh, the best way to talk about IB inspectable is to actually use it. As some fellows pointed out, it's up to you. You don't have to use IB Inspectable to know what button got pressed or what position got pressed. Everybody with me? I have nine buttons on screen. I need to know somehow which button got pressed, right? If we look at our buttons here, it's very similar to what type of data structure? We have three data structures that we spoke about in Swift in Swift Fundamentals. Which data structure best represents this, this board? That's a good interview question. If you were to model tic-tac-toe, what data structure would you use? And enum, enums are good for cases, right? Case x, case what, whatever, zero, or case o, right? But how can I model the data? How can I keep track of the, the game? Like, what data structure can I use to keep track of the game? An array, right? According to uh, Mr. Bienvenido there. An array, right? What type of array would you use, sir? Right, an array, I'll probably use a multi-dimensional array, right? I'll probably use a multi-dimensional array because you have two things to keep track of. You have this index here, would probably be zero, zero. Everybody with me? Right? One dimension doesn't have enough to keep track of the board. So I use a two-dimensional array, right, according to Mr. Bienvenido here. So this, the first left button would be zero, zero. For example, yes, if we're looking at our array back in arrays lecture, so this would be zero, zero. What would this index be? Zero, zero. zero one. Everybody with me? So row, row one is row zero, correct? So the first row here is row zero. What is this row? What's the second row? Row one. Row one, what's the third row? Row two, what's the first column? Second column, third column. What is this position here, that last X at the bottom right? What position is that? Two, two, everybody got me? So that's exactly what you wanna use. You wanna use some array matrix to model your, um, your game, your board, your game board should be some sort of array, uh, 2D array there. Everybody with me? All right, very good. So let's all, Fork the project together and see what the project gives us, like what's the template of it. So I will fork. I'll go to the fork button here. I will fork the project. How is your Wi-Fi going? It's going? Same thing, okay. I, okay, mine is fork now. After I fork, what do I do? I clone, so I go ahead and copy that, clone that. I'll go to terminal. Since I forked and I'm about to clone, do I have to do get in it? No. No, right? Why don't I have to do get in it? Because it already has a get in it, right? On GitHub, it has a get history already. So far, so good? So what I'll do, I'll navigate somewhere, either my desktop or my documents folder, right? And I will clone it there. In my case, I will simply just clone it at my desktop. Let me zoom up here. So I will go get clone, well, go to desktop. Get clone. And clone the project, fiddle destination already exists. What do I have here? Uh, let me remove this. Get clone. 
Okay, great. So my clone is ready. I will go ahead. One way you could open Finder, you could open Finder in Terminal. Right, everybody? To open Finder in Terminal, if I want to open Finder, like a Finder window in Terminal, I simply type in open space, open space, dot. So you navigated somewhere in Terminal, right? And you want to open that folder, like visually. Open space, dot, and press Enter. That opens up a Finder window. Cool? All right, so here I have my project. Right, I have my project, the Pursuit Core assess, um, Assignment 1 from uni, Unit 2. I could go ahead and open it now, go into it. Right, we should have images, a README, and a tic-tac-toe folder. So far, so good? All right. Click on the tic-tac-toe folder. Double click on tic-tac-toe.xcode project. Double click on it. That's going to go ahead and open up Xcode. OK, let me set my preferences. Are we all able to open up Xcode at this point? Yes? Cool, 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 cool. All right, let's navigate what we have in the project. So open up your navigation area. We have our basic files. Let me zoom in here. We have our app delegate. We have our view controller. Next week, we'll start talking about the life cycles of a view controller, like what happens when you launch your app, what methods it goes through. So far, we've only seen the standard method. It's viewed it load. Everybody with me? So viewed it load, we've been using viewed it load if you want to have some startup code. Like I have my color guessing game. When the game starts, I want it to have some random color. Where do I put my code? in view did load. Everybody with me? Because view did load is that method that gets called when your view is on screen. Cool? But next week we'll see more methods there. There's more methods. There's view will disappear. There's view will appear. There's view will layout subviews. There's a lot of, there's about 10-ish or so life cycles. And we'll also talk about the app delegate, like what happens when your app first launches, like what cycles it goes through. We'll talk about view controller, and I was about to say sin delegate, but this project was actually created with Xcode 10. So that's why there's no sin delegate. I was about to say sin delegate, right? So if we create a new project, we have sin delegate so far, yes? But here we don't have a sin delegate because that project was created with Xcode 10. Everybody with me? But in the sin delegate, which is new in Xcode uh, 11, we'll talk about sin delegate as well. Let's go to where it says game button. So click on game button. Let me zoom back here. We all clicked on game button, correct? We're now seeing an at IB inspectable. We've seen at IB outlet. We've seen I at IB action, right? We've seen those. An outlet is a connection to a property. An action is a connection to a method or a function. So far, so good. With that inspectable prefix here, that compiler directive, Again, it's giving Interface Builder information. Here is the Interface Builder. I have this class. I have a class called Game Button. It's of type UI Button. So far, so good. I have a Game Button. It inherits from UI Button. And I have two properties here. I have a row and I have a column. They're both initialized to zero. So far, so good. The only thing that's new here is the at IB inspectable. This only Interface Builder sees this when you create, when you go to Interface Builder, which we'll go to, Interface Builder now recognizes this game button has extra properties on it, right? Normally, if you have a UI button, it doesn't have a row and a column. Everybody with me? If I create a new, if I drag a UI button into my storyboard, it doesn't come with a row and column. But if you want to add extra attributes, if you want to add extra attributes onto your class, right? You could have IB inspectable there and say, hey, I want to add extra attributes. Here we want to add extra attributes on our button. We want the button to be able to tell us what row it is, what row it is, and what column it is. Everybody with me? Right? So that gives us that information there. So when the user clicks on the button, I'm able to inspect it by knowing the row and the column of that button. 
That gives us the information we need to figure out, hey, did the user click on row two, column two? Everybody with me? So with that class, we'll be able to create our buttons, right? And our buttons, as we drag them into storyboard, there'll be UI buttons by default. We'll change the class from UI button to game button. Everybody with me? So the class, when you drag a class, it's a UI button. But our custom button is game button. So we'll change the class. That's the first time we'll actually change a class in Interface Builder. So we'll change the class from the, from the default UI button to our game button. Everybody with me? So we'll do that together. And once we do that, then our button becomes a game button. Then we could say game button dot row, game button dot color. Everybody with me? OK. So again, I'm showing you this. If you want to use it, definitely go ahead and use it. If you feel like I'll just do this without using the inspectable button, that's up to you. So far, so good. But as far as like getting started, this is going to get you started quicker. Right? You could create an enum. You could create some tag. You could create things. You could do things there. Yeah? without using IB Inspectable. Everybody with me? As we get more into iOS development, we'll see how we could have our custom class, for example, if we want to have all our buttons have a rounded rect, we could say, hey, class, call it rounded button, and then we could come here and say IB Inspectable, some variable, corner radius, some default corner radius. So now all our buttons, as long as it inherits, from our corner button, it will have those properties. But we'll talk more about that as we go more into iOS development. But for now, IB Inspectable is very, it's a very handy tool. It enables you to render real time. We're not rendering anything with this particular IB Inspectable property, but a rounded rect could render in Interface Builder what your button looks like for you without running the code. Okay? So if I have a button with some rounded rect, when I say rounded rect, like it's soft at the edges. It's not pointy. It has like a semicircle at the edge of the button. That's a rounded rect. It's very similar to any app you have on the iPhone or Android. They're all Android as well, right? Android has rounded rects, or is it all square? The icons, the app icons. They're rounded, right? Of course, of course they're rounded. They, they took it from us, right? Uh, why would they do squares? All right, so all our icons, our app icons have rounded rect on them. So if you want to have your buttons in your whatever you create in, have a rounded rect by default, you could use IB Inspectable, see how it is in the Interface Builder, how it renders before you run the code. Everybody with me? All right, cool. All right, with that said, let's go to Storyboard. So click on Storyboard. Again, we have a blank slate here. This is what we have. At this point, just run your application. Run it on an iPhone 11 Pro Max. As I said, we haven't spoken about auto layout. We will next week, right? If you've gained enough of like your labs and everything, you can start looking at auto layout and reading up on that lesson there. But we'll start talking about auto layout next week. But for now, make sure your iPhone 11 Pro Max is selected as the simulator here. So my simulator says iPhone 11 Pro Max. And my view as should be the same. So view as here, view as at the bottom. And let's select iPhone Pro Max here. Cool. So they're both in sync. Again, when we're talking about all layout, it doesn't matter what device, what simulator you're running on. Cool? They'll be dynamic. Our layout, our layout views will go dynamic with whatever device we have. Great. Let me take this out here. OK, cool. So what do we want to do? We want to drag in. For now, we're just dragging three buttons. It's your assignment, so I'll just get you started. But I'm not going to go like create all the things for you. I just want to get you up to date as far as like IB Inspectable and using that and what that looks like. So far, so good. All right, so let's go ahead and drag a button. How do we get to the library? Command Shift L, thank you, Tanya. So here we'll look for a button. It's a UI button. We'll drag the UI button over to our scene. I'll lay it right in the center. I'll use the layout guidelines to help me center it. Great. If I want to get a next button on my scene, what's, what's one way I could do it? Should I drag in the next button? 
Very good. So Matt here is saying option drag, right? So we'll option drag on our current button. I'll take one at the top somewhere. I'll also option drag, put one in the bottom here. Okay, cool. So that's good for now. Great. So currently we have three buttons on screen. So far so good. If I click on my button, click on the top button, make sure your inspector's window is open to your right. Make sure your inspector's window is open. We all should have our attributes inspector as the default inspector open, correct? correct? Great. So today we'll see a new inspector, right? We'll see what's known as the identity inspector, right? The identity inspector is right to the left of the attributes inspector. So go ahead and click on the identity inspector. Anybody needs to catch up? We all good here? You got it. Kiss of the Fridays. Got it. Very good. Very good. Okay, cool. So at this point, our identity inspector is where? To the left of our attributes inspector. Correct? So click on our identity inspector. Our identity inspector gives us information about the class that we have, the, the class we inspected, right? Every element we have on that scene has some class they belong to, okay? They're all some sort of UI view at the end of the day. They're all inheriting from UI view, okay? So here we have a button. It inherits from a control. A control inherits from a UI view. So far, so good. If we see the class of our button, what does the class say? What type of class is it? It's a UI button, right? It should be. That's what we dragged in. By default, you drag in a button, it's a UI button. So far, so good. OK, if I zoom back, click into where it says class. Click inside the class um, box there where it says class. Click inside of it and start typing G, like G, like just simply type in G. Do you see game button come up? At this point, Xcode knows there's other button classes in our project. We just saw our game button class. So far, so good? It works because the game button inherits from UI button. If, we, if game button was inheriting from some other sort of class, it would not pop up. But it knows it's a button. So all buttons you have in your Xcode project, it will come up as options. Here we only have one option. It's game button. So here, press enter. Press enter and make sure the module check is on. That blue check there that says inherit module from project, make sure this is selected, OK? It's the one we just added now. You see where it says inherit module from? So when you press enter, that automatically checks. OK, so make sure that's checked there. If it's not checked, you have issues. It's not going to find your game button. It will be like missing files, whatever it is. All right, so zoom back. So at this point, we've changed our first button to be a class game button, OK? Now, look at that. If you go to Attributes Inspector, what happens? Go to Attributes Inspector. Is there anything different? Right? So as Tiffany is saying, now we have a row and we have a column attribute. So if I go to my Attributes Inspector, look, at the very top here, I have a row and a column now. That row and that column is coming from the class properties that we defined, OK? Everybody, remember a subclass could have, it, could have its own properties. In that case, my game, my game button has its own properties. So those properties come along, and look at this. At the top, you have game button. At the bottom, what do you have? Button. What does that mean? That means game button inherits from button. And if you keep going down, button inherits from control. If you keep going down, control inherits from View, right? So again, we did say that UIKit has a lot of inheritance, a lot of classes. That's a typical use case of it right here. Everybody with me? So now we created a game button class. It has its own properties via IB inspectable. And now we have access to those properties. So far, so good. All right, let's zoom back. 
If you click on the second button, you realize that there's no row and column. So far, so good. If you click on the second, the center button, there's no row and column. So now go ahead and do it for the second and do it for the third. Make them inherit from game button. Everybody got what they're doing? All right, cool. Go ahead. That's your homework. We're not doing the homework together. Um, after that, we'll connect it to View Controller because we, we don't have enough information yet. We, I want to leave you guys making sure that when you click on the thing, you see the row and the color. And at that point, we'll stop the overview. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Whatever uh, is easier for you. All right, so let's continue. So we said the second button, let's make it the second button here. Make sure you click on the second button. We want to make the class. What's the class going to be? Game button. Very good. So I'm going to change it. You could also use the toggle, the toggle button here, that down toggle. You could also use that, right? Uh, just click on it and change it to game button. Xcode sometimes plays around. Make sure you press enter. Just make sure you press enter. Anytime you do anything in Interface Builder that has to do with like adding text or whatever, make sure you press enter because sometimes Xcode itself doesn't commit that change. Okay? So get in the habit of doing that, even if it should do it automatically, but don't assume with Xcode. All right, let's do, let's confirm, go to attribute inspector. This is good. We have our row and our column. Let's do the last one here. And this one, same, game button, press enter, go to attribute inspector. This is good. Okay, for the purposes of our illustration, we'll say this is the first column. First column, so far so good. How many rows do we have here? How many rows do we have? Three. Very good. How many rows do we have, Yulia? Three. Very good. Everybody sees that, right? We have one row. I mean, sorry, we have one column going top down, one column, and we have three rows horizontally. So our rows are horizontal. Our columns are vertical. So far, so good? Okay, cool. So what we'll do, we'll do some editing here. This is very similar to what we did with the tagging. For our first row column what should the values be zero zero so let's enter that into our attribute inspector pane here sorry so for the first one put in zero zero so here put zero press enter zero press enter great what would be the second button one zero right does that make sense why one? Second row. And why zero? First column. Okay, so let's go ahead and edit that. For now, as I said, this is the first one we're talking about. It could be the middle, you could shift it later when you're ready. Right? Okay, cool. So let's see. As a matter of fact, you know you could do this in Interface Builder, right? You could select. No, like you could move them together like this. Right, like we could basically select all by basically using the mouse, using the mouse, point down and select all the buttons you want. Everybody with me? Right, we'll, yeah, we'll get more used to little things like that. So that's a good way to select all three buttons and move them where you want to. Cool? All right, so let's keep going here. So we mark this one, did we mark that one? All right, so that one we said is what? What's the row? One, correct? The second button, the middle button, what's the row? One. And we said the column is zero. Cool. And the last one, what is the row for the last one? Two. And what's the column? Zero. Great. So at this point, as I said, you could keep this as the center, change the values, or you could simply move it to the left. OK? But what we know, we know we copy. So you could copy all three and move it to the either left or right. Right, everybody with me? I could select all, option click, and I have three at once. Cool? All right, great. So let us keep, what do you mean? What's the... How do we get to the assistant editor? Okay, so the top, right, I'll click on it, and I'll click on assistant editor, right, to get my view controller in view. So I'll click on assistant editor, 
For now, we do not need the inspector's window anymore, so I'll close it. And we have our view controller. Great. I also do not need my navigation area for now. Again, maximize the space of Xcode because we have small devices, small screens here. All right, so I have my view controller code to the right. I have my view to the left, right? Again, in MVC, so far we only have one view. That's the current view we're looking at on the left. Our controller is the view controller to the right. So far, so good. Here we haven't got the model yet, but as I said, your model should be what? Your game board, right? The model should be your game board. That's where the data, that, that's where the data of your application should live. Everybody, that's the model part of it. Okay, awesome. So let's edit our view controller. I'm also, I'm also going to show you something else, which we haven't seen. Some of you maybe may have seen it. But you could have an outlet, or you could have an outlet collection. An outlet collection is very similar to an array. Again, collection implies um, a bucket of things, okay? So here we'll create an outlet collection as opposed to dragging each button to create an outlet, okay? So here we'll create like three outlets. We're not going to do that. We'll create an array of buttons. So far, so good? So how we do that is very similar to what we've always been doing with outlets. We'll control drag from our button, control drag from our button over the override. We do not put outlets below the override function. Right, so here we have our outlet. Don't do anything yet. Let's zoom in and see what we have. So here it says connection outlet, right? That's the default we get. So far, so good. If I click on that option here, I see outlet collection. Do we see outlet collection? So we have outlet, we have action, and we have outlet collection. A collection is an array. So if I click on outlet collection, click on outlet collection, and for the name, we'll simply call it game buttons. Game buttons, plural, it's a collection. It should not be singular at any point. And I click connect, right? Look at this, we have an array now of game buttons. So far, so good, right? I could simply now drag over from my view controller over to the remaining buttons. How many buttons do we have to connect now? Two more, so let's do that. I'll drag from my view controller over to button two, drag from my view controller again where the circle is here, over to my last button, great. So again, definitely you want to make sure that all your buttons are highlighted to make sure that they're connected by hovering over the circle here, right? So now we know all our buttons are connected. So far, so good. Great. So here we have a collection of game buttons. Great. So now let's create some sort of action to test. Like when we click on a button, what happens? Here we want to test to see what row and column got selected. So far, so good. Okay, so we'll create an action down here. Outlet should go over your first, yeah. So based on, remember how we laid out our code in unit one with object-oriented programming. We said property should be at the top. Methods, initializers, well, initializers and methods, right? Same thing here. There's no initializers in our view controller. So properties, IB outlet, that's still a property. It's still connecting to a property. Do not put your IB outlet beneath any function, right? You'll be thrown upon, okay? So properties, we'll, we'll label it later, but now let's make our action, then we'll come back and label it. So I want to drag, control drag, control drag from my button over below my view did load, below my view did load. And here, let's zoom in. So this time it's an action, right? It's an action, the name of the action, I'll say game button pressed. I'll change type any to type. Look at that, we have game button now, right? That's what we want, we don't want UI button. UI button doesn't know about game button. Everybody with me? The parent doesn't know what a child has. Does that make sense? If I say UI button dot row, it would be, that would be a compiler error. 
Okay? The parent doesn't inherit from the child. We're not in that universe. Right? But the child inherits from the parent. The game button has a row, it has a column. Does the UI button have a row and a column? No. So here, let's make sure that we're using game button. The one we created. Touch up inside stays default and click connect. Great. Sender, we're not crazy about the word sender. We refactor that argument label sender to game button. We refactor it. We're not going to manually change it. Everybody with me? I'm not going to manually change sender to game button. How will I change the name? What's that? Refactor, right? So I will right click on the word sender. I will right click on the word sender. I'll go down to refactor, right? Do we see refactor? I'll go down to refactor, I'll go down to rename. Okay? That's all I want. And at that point, I'll say I want this to be called game button. I'll press enter. Yes? If you do not do that, you'll get compiler errors. Yes. Because most likely, there's other places you need to change that name as well. Right? And you'll get crashes with responder not, responder, responding to selector not found, those errors there. It will be a bit cryptic, but we'll get more used to being able to debug that error there. Again, when you see one of those errors, you're going to scroll all the way up, right before the zero, and see what it's not look, see what it's not seeing. Like most likely, it will tell you the name of that label or action. All right, cool. So now we have our action. It's called game button pressed. Let us. Oh, we need to re uh, wire the rest. So, are we going to create a new action for each button? No, right? One action. That's it. So now let's reverse connect it. So we'll go from the IB action function, right? That circle right there. We'll drag to our second button, and we'll drag to our third button, right? So at this point, our three buttons are connected to the action. So far, so good. Great. So for now, we are done with uh, the scene. So we could close the scene out. I can close my scene, go back to my view controller, and this is what our view controller is right now. Let me organize the code a little bit so it's clearer, we can see everything. So we started off with an outlet of collection of buttons, an array of buttons. We had our view did load by default, right? And then we have our game button pressed. In our game button press, we'll simply put a print statement to let the user know what button, what column, and row got selected. All right? In that case, the user is us. That's just for testing for debug purposes. All right? For debug purposes, we'll write a print statement. So print we'll say row. And now we have game button. So we'll use our game button argument here. So game button dot, you see that? Now we have the properties that we have in our class. We have the column and we have the row. Does that make sense, right? That's from IB Inspectable. So here we'll say game button dot row. So here row. Add column. How do we get access to the column? Game button add column. Right. So row add column was selected. Cool. So at this point, we'll run our application. If your simulator is running already, you should be able to click on your buttons and see 
a console log showing what button, what row, column you got selected. Okay, so here we have our simulator running. We have the three buttons that we created. And now let's test what's happening. So here, this should be what row and column, the first one? Zero, zero, so let's see if we click on it. Indeed, it does say row column at, row zero at column zero was selected. Everybody with me? If I click on the second one, I should expect row one now, right? At column zero. Same as the third option. Row two at column zero. So far, so good. Now we know how to create the other buttons using IB Inspectable, right? So that part of the logic of that part of knowing what was selected, we know. We have more code to write, right? Like each time something got selected, you need to let your board know what got selected. Everybody with me? I have an array of arrays. I click on zero, zero, I need to update that board, okay? That part, that's, us, that's for us to do or for you to do. So you have that information there. Cool? How to link what the button pressed on the view to your model. Okay? It goes through the controller, but it goes through the board ultimately. All right, great. Let me show us one more thing, and um, we'll stop here for the day. So go back to your, your uh, storyboard. Go back to your storyboard. Click on the first Click on the first button. So new in Xcode 11 and iOS 13, again, you guys have some new hotness here to work with. We have what's called SF symbols. We have what's called SF symbols. Let me get a Google link to you. Uh, SF symbols, Xcode. This guy. You might not heavily need it for this project, but I just want us to point, I just want to, I, I want to point us to it, what it looks like. Because before SF symbols, if you wanted a simple icon in your project, you would have to go to like icons eight um, or some website like that to get icons into your app. When I'm talking about icons eight, I'm talking about a site like this. So we have icons. Icons 8, right? So we had, you still probably use a site like that for like extra images, but here you could have gone and be like, hey, I want an image, like whatever, like an X image, iOS, whatever. Come on. Right, and you'll get icons here. Nothing found. Rendering. Uh, Wi-Fi. Okay, we'll come back to icon eight. But anyway, uh, back to SF symbols. SF symbols has a whole asset catalog of font images available to us now. I think there's about 1,500 images available in iOS 13. Before iOS 13, we did not have that. We did not have fonts that could render like images. Now we have fonts that could render like images. Here I have a font. I could make it look bold if I want where my mouse is at that bottom, bottom right here, right? So those we could add onto our button. On my button, I could have an X image and I could have a circle image from the system itself. Yes, you could go ahead and get your own images, but I wanted us to see what we have available to us. So far, so good. And as I said, like we have a ton of images here. Like you see all those images now available to us. I could simply create an image. I could simply create an image, a cloud image that I want, and this would be the name of the image, right? In Xcode, you could use either Interface Builder to grab that image, or you could do it in code. But we have SF symbols now available to us. Very powerful, very nice, right? And they're rendered, they scale very good. You could font it up, you could font it down, the sizes, like the thing is awesome, right? It saves the data. Let me select that out. That's one of those things you probably definitely want to bookmark. Again, you could start using it now or later, but know that it's available before we start going and look for fonts that exist already. Does that make sense? Since I'm looking for something that exists, it's here, it's ready. 
and there's sites like sfsymbols.com, um, right? <laughs> it's funny. The minute like Apple releases something, somebody like has a website for it already. It's like amazing. But uh, this person has a website where you could search for fonts that's available. And Apple also, if we go back to, if we go back to the page, Apple also has, I highly recommend downloading, where is it? I highly recommend downloading, do we see where it says SF Symbols app? I highly recommend downloading that app. It's a Mac app. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I actually already see it in... Oh, it probably came with Catalina. Yeah, 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 yeah. it came with, yeah, no, no, you see it in Xcode, you see it there. Yeah, 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 you see there. So that website is almost like redundant in a sense, the one I showed you, the ssymbols.com, because it's part of Xcode. But before Xcode was finally released, they had that already. Uh, but the SS symbols I'm talking about, please download this one uh, right on that website here, the first link, the SS symbols app. So when you download that app, you could simply search for it in Spotlight by typing SF symbols. As I typed in SF, I have the app already. Everybody with me? I have the app already, it's installed. I could say SF symbols, press enter. And here, I have all the icons on my Mac. Everybody okay with that? Right, so here, again, that website is almost redundant, like don't even use it anymore because Apple at this point will be more updated than that other third party website. Everybody? So here, I have all the icons and I could browse what I wanna use, right? Cool? Great, so that's like SF symbols there, overview. Let's go back to our app. So for the button, let's select on our first button, open up your inspectors window. We go to attribute inspector. We'll go down to background image. Click on background image. Let me zoom in. Click on background image, and as Melinda was saying, here we have all the images that I just spoke about with SF symbols. So all those images here are SF symbols, okay? I will simply search X mark here, for example. All right, I have an X. Again, feel free to use whatever image you want. Everybody okay? Feel free to use whatever image you want. But that particular image renders regardless up and down very easily. It's not gonna look pixelated. When I say it renders really good, it doesn't look pixelated. You might download something from the web, the size might be small, when you start scaling it up, it looks pixelated. Again, we're not grading for design right now, but just to let you guys know, some of you guys probably have design backgrounds already anyway, but just to let you know the thing exists. So here we have X mark, I could double click on that, and look, I have my mark coming here. And for this one, I could simply search, circle, I could simply search for circle and get a circle. Again, it's up to you if you want to use it or not. That's fine. One other thing I want to talk about. I keep saying one other thing. Um, so click, right now the image itself looks somewhat squashed, right? Everybody? A circle or anything that you want to look, it, we want to make it look square, right? We want to make it look like a circle. For example, the circle here, it doesn't look like a circle. It looks like, a, like some sort of like ellipse or some oval shape, right? That doesn't look good. So I want to change the size of it. One way I could change the size of it is to drag it in Interface Builder. But that's not as efficient. I want to go someplace where I could say, I want this thing to be 60 by 60. Where do I go for that? I go to the Size Inspector. The Size Inspector is where you go to inspect the size of a particular element. So here I could click on my circle. Go to the size inspector. The size inspector is to the right of the attributes inspector. So let me zoom in here. So this ruler here, the vertical ruler, is called the size inspector. So I click on the size inspector, and I could go down now to where it says the views width and height. Let me zoom in. Do we see width and height here? Do we see width and height? We do, right? So here I could simply double click on the width and change it to the width I want. If I want it to be a circle, it needs to be the same. The width and the height needs to be the same, right? That's circle, or else you don't have a circle. So here I say width is 60 and height is 60, right? Already we see it's a perfect circle on the left here in our view, right? So again, that's the size inspector. We go down to where it says view and we change 
the width and the height. Okay? Yes, we'll do it for the, the two other buttons as well. Um, cool, so let us zoom out here. So the X, for example, I click on the X. Size inspector is open already. Are you in your size inspector? The X was uh, an X mark uh, system image. I'll do it for the last one. So for the last one, let's do the last one together for people who missed the image part of it. So click on the last button. Go to Attribute Inspector to change the image. Everybody? Go to the Attribute Inspector. Go to where it says Background. Do you see Background? Mm -hmm. Click on Background. And search for X mark. Did you search for X mark? Not scroll down, search, type in. Searching is not gonna take you forever. So search for X mark, type in X mark. And click on that image you see there. Cool? All right, now we wanna change the sizes of the thing. It doesn't look exactly correct. So we go to the size inspector, which is next to the attributes inspector, to the right of the attributes inspector. You click on size inspector. And for the size, we change it to 60 by 60. And we press enter. Do the same for the top. And again, it's up to you what sizes and everything you want to do there. Uh, cool. So here we have our three buttons for now. I'll center it somewhere here. Great. And we do not want the titles, so we remove the titles, right? The titles just look weird. So I go back to the attributes inspector, and where it says title, do we see title here? Do we see title? Just remove the title. Double click on button and delete. Right, enter, click on the second one, double click on button, delete, enter, click on the last one, double click on button, delete, press enter, great. Perfect. Let's run our app again, make sure everything still runs the same. Great, so we have our first row, or sorry, we have our first column. So if I click on it, it works as the same as before, right? So far, so good. So far, so good. So we know about the is hidden property. Obviously, when you start playing the game, the user do not see the options, yes? They see an empty slate, correct? Let me see if I have some tic-tac-toe game on this, on this computer. Computer, computer. Uh, if we put the X and the O there, Right? So your game looks something like this. Everybody, can we see the screen? Obviously, when the user starts playing the game, they do not see X and O. Does that make sense? When I start playing the game, somebody puts in an X, they get an X, right? Not put in, but they click on it. Somebody, now, look, player two turn. Do we see the label? The label changed to player two turn. That's part of the requirements. What you do, how you place it, up to you. But player two needs to know it's their turn. Everybody with me? Player two plays, for some reason, they don't know what they're doing. Um, right, it's my turn again, correct? Okay, again, player two seems to be somewhat missed here. Doesn't know what he's doing. Right, it's player's one turn. So far, so good. So far, so good. You guys gotta give me feedback for me to continue. Now I play, boom, this guy wins. Disregard the X, please. Dis disregard that strike through. That's not a requirement. Don't ask me right now, okay? It's not a requirement of the game. Do we get that? The only requirement is player one one at the bottom here. Do we see the bottom, the label, okay? That line is outside the scope of the class, okay? Everybody with me? The what? Uh, that is a requirement. You could get an image. You could simply do a Google search for tic-tac-toe board. 
get the image and use it as an image for your view. Does that make sense, everybody? Everybody. Again, this one was rendered using views outside the scope of the class. Oh, look at that. You, you see, Mr. Matt just found a, a, a grade for us as an SF symbol. Awesome. Thank you, sir. So you see how great SF symbols are. They're amazing. So now you could scale the thing up. It doesn't look pixelated like something you got on Google. All right? So slack that out if you have that there. Everybody with me? So again, really cool. Like We're in a great time for iOS development here. All right, so we'll stop here. Again, the strike through is not a requirement. Do not come to us for that. That's outside the scope of unit two. So far, so good. All right, the only thing we're saying is the player one, okay? Great.